Hey guys, welcome to another week of BSF, second last one for 2021. I wonder whether you listen to this in the car, whether you watch it on the train on your way to the office, offices are opening up again, uh, or whether you make time in the evenings. Uh, whichever way it is, we're glad you tuned in, and I hope you are still getting blessed out of the study of Matthew. I've got some big news for you uh, before I hand over to our lecture time. From January 2022, the BSF evening men's classes in Melbourne and Geelong are going to be joining forces. We will be from January 22, BSF Melbourne and Geelong. We will be one big group. Uh, this is only days old. This is not weeks old. Uh, and so there's a whole lot of detail around that that is not yet worked out. We are going to uh, get together with the leaders team from Geelong uh, and we're going to sort some of those things out. But you can imagine how, um, how much detail there is to sort through. And on top of that, the BSF system is down right now for maintenance. I wanted to reassure you of a few things as you think about, wow, what happens when two classes join together. Uh, let me tell you some of the guiding principles. Number one, we're not going to break up discussion groups unnecessarily. It is not our desire to reshuffle people just for the sake of it. We are also BS, uh, we are also committed to having BSF in Geelong. Uh, this is not us backing out of Geelong. This is us staying in Geelong, and this is a way for us to stay in Geelong. We're looking forward to working together with the two groups of leaders from Melbourne and Geelong. And we've spent a little bit of time with the Geelong guys recently, and it was such a blessing. The uh, changes the, the changes will take effect from January when we recommence, and there will be some changes to our original plans. Uh, as you can imagine, bringing in uh, a class, uh, joining together with a class that's so remote has its challenges, and we are going to have to make some adaptations. School program will be one of those. It's very possible that the school program will be online for the rest of our Matthew study. That's yet to be confirmed. We're working through some options, but that is a real possibility. Not every decision is going to be an easy one, but I want you to know that the staff team at BSF are going to be prayerful and careful. And I would ask you to join with us as we pray together that we would do this well. It is our desire that we grow the impact of BSF uh, for the kingdom of God. Uh, it is not our desire to do anything other than that. And so that is what we seek to do. We want to do that in a loving way. We want to do that in an effective way. And uh, I would ask you to pray for us as we do that. I'm going to hand you over to our lecture time. Philip Chow, one of our substitute teaching leaders, is going to take us through the first of our two-week series in the parables of Jesus. So let's hand over to Phil and enjoy the lecture time. Thanks very much. Good afternoon, brothers. It is good to be back with you. In the latest release of the James Bond movie, No Time to Die, though not yet released at the time of this writing, I'm looking forward to watching this movie. I must confess that I'm an avid fan of the 007 series. A British agent that never dies, always between the good versus the evil, and a display of the latest gadgets with fanciful cast and a good storyline. This element brings together a movie worth your time and money. And as for Jesus, he teaches true parables which are also stories with good versus evil. In this week's studies, we have two divisions. First division, responsiveness of the hearts. Second division, deceptions of the enemy. The truth of today's lesson is, God distinguishes true believers and counterfeits. Now let's discuss what is a parable? Why does Jesus use parables to teach the people? A parable is a practical 
real life story that conveys a spiritual truth or a central idea. Parable uses everyday objects and relationships to illustrate such truth. Parables can compel listeners to discover truth, while at the same time concealing truth from those too lazy or stubborn to see it. But to those who are earnest listeners or seekers of the truth, they will pursue to gain clarification or explanation so that the truth will become clear. Generally, parable contains one or two key lessons. Prior to Matthew chapter 13, Jesus' teachings have been clearly, directly, and plainly presented to the crowds. But that is changing. Here we see that Jesus begins his teachings through parables. At the beginning of Matthew 13, the crowd continues following Jesus. Although Jesus had no social media accounts, such as Twitter, Facebook, or TikTok, yet Jesus had such a following. And I can only imagine that he would easily command millions of followers on his social media accounts if he had that. Yet, yet none of this. On this day, Jesus' crowd consists of consisted of two groups of people in general. These people were curious of who Jesus is, his works, miracles, and his healings. Or perhaps they were looking for a free meal and wondering what's on the menu today. Bread, loaves, and fishes? Sorry, he didn't use menu law either. Most likely, these people were hungry for Jesus' teaching, the spiritual hunger that only Jesus can fulfill. They have been waiting for the Messiah. The other group of people were the teachers of the laws, the Pharisees. They were there to find out what he was teaching and why he had such a following. And I can imagine they felt insecure too a threat to the teachings and followings. And they were there to question Jesus' authority. Jesus has been preaching and teaching in private homes or outdoors, not because they have uh, indoor crowd restrictions or social distancing, but because it was more and getting more and more difficult for Jesus to teach in the synagogues or in the temples. Nonetheless, the crowd followed Jesus whenever he was going. Jesus got into a boat and sat on it, while the crowd stood on the shore. It was perhaps e easier to speak to a large crowd. Jesus began by telling them a parable of the sower. Actually, it is more appropriately named as the parable of the souls. Now, let's read from uh, Matthew chapter uh, 13, verses 9, uh, verses 3 to 9. Now, let's read from Matthew chapter 13, verses 3 to 9. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed, and as he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was swallow, shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Other seeds fell among the thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil, where it produced a crop, a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. He who has ears, let him hear. <clears throat> I can imagine what was going through the minds of the crowds. Mind you, most of these people were fishermen, carpenters, merchants, 
homemakers, and even young children. They may not be highly educated too. So for them to listen to a parable of the souls or about farming would have caused many to wonder, what is he talking about? And who is he referring to? What has it got to do with me? Perhaps more questions than answers. In verse six, uh, in verse nine, Jesus concluded this parable with, whoever has ears, let them hear. Jesus called them to listen and understand. And it was an active command. It's not just a passive thing. We are all given a pair of ears. But how are we using them? And what are you listening to? Our ears are connected to our mind. When we listen, do we take a step further beyond understanding and applying them in our lives? As we listen to the lessons, what do we do about them? I encourage you to listen, understand, and apply into our lives. Otherwise, they will only become hate knowledge. And we need to move from the hate to the heart. In the business of our lives, are we even listening? What is crowding our ears that we do not make time and space to listen to the still, small voice of the Holy Spirit? Unless we make time and space, and by setting time to be alone with Jesus, other voices will occupy our ears and our minds. He who has ears, let him hear. Listen. Reading verse 12. Whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. Now, I've got good news and I've got bad news. Let's start with the good news. For those who listen, more understanding will be given. But what is Jesus giving? Is giving the secrets, the mysteries about the kingdom of God. It is given to those who desire and pursue him. Our God is generous in his giving. He gives an abundance of knowledge. Many came to Jesus, but only few were given such mysteries. Not because he's holding back, but only few are willing to pursue and desire to listen and understanding, willing to be at his feet listening. Are you willing to sit at his feet to listen and understand? Do you hunger for his word and his teachings? It requires making time and space. It requires setting priorities and making sacrifices. And it is important to do a self-reflection and self-examination of how we spend our time. What does my calendar in a week look like? How am I filling my days, hours, and minutes? At the end of the day, will we receive the abundance of knowledge that Jesus talked about in verse 12? The flip side of not listening and understanding is revealed in the latter part of verse 12. But to those who are not listening, even what little understanding that they have will be taken away from them. These are the consequences of obeying and disobeying. So before we risk losing every bit of our understanding, let us listen and understand. Personally, I would rather be listening and understanding so that the abundance of knowledge will be added to me. Choose for yourself which situation you rather have. Choices with eternal consequences. And it is an investment with eternal values and returns. In verse 16, similar to our years, God has given us eyes to see. Are we seeing what we ought to see? And what are we watching? In this world and age, we are loaded with information. Indeed, there's a lot of good information that builds and expands our knowledge. But at the same time, 
there's a lot of useless information too. And they may not necessarily edify us. In fact, some information are harmful. We have fake news. And to the extent that there are even laws passed against fake news. We are loaded and bombarded with images. Images that enhances our understanding and gives us better appreciation of things. If we use them well, it can improve our knowledge and understanding. But there are many things that our eyes not, ought not to see. For example, pornography and etc. You know, like the Sunday school song that I learned when I was a child? Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. For the Father up above is looking down on you. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. From verses 18, here Jesus is using this parable to explain the farmer who was sowing the seeds. And as he was sowing the seeds, some of them were scattered along the pathway. The pathway illustrates a place where there is no soil. The ground that is too hard and not possible for the seeds to germinate and grow. It would not be too long before the birds would come and eat up the seeds. Similarly, if our hearts are hardened, refusing to listen to his words, it will not grow. It would become easy target for the devil to come and snatch it away. Still, there are some seeds that fall on rocky places. This illustrates those who receive the word with great joy, showing great growth potential. This group speaks of those who ask, what's in it for me? What benefit can I get out of this? Because there's no strong roots or spiritual foundations, when the storm of life comes or hit with persecutions because of their faith, they would easily fall away. Instead of perse persevering and pressing on to trust in God or calling him for his help, now, the story is told of Bob. Bob was invited to attend a Christian summer retreat. During the retreat, he had chosen to follow Jesus. His life changed and he was filled with joy and how exciting it is. Summer holiday was over and when the school reopens, a few of his mates whom he used to hang out with soon found out about his newfound faith. They began deserting him. They tease him and they even call him names, Jesus Freak. And of course, Bob was hurt. He felt isolated. He lost all his friends and they no longer wanted to hang out with him. He's no longer cool. The pressure was great and he began questioning his walk with Jesus. Bob decided that the cost of following Jesus is too high a price to pay. He valued his mate's friendship more than following Jesus. He then quit going to church and he soon rejoined his circle of friends. Perhaps it would be more accurate to say that Bob, the shallow pers uh, soil person, is one who joins in, perhaps maybe even says that he has chosen to follow Jesus, but falls away as quickly as he joined, because he had never actually accepted Christ. He just liked the idea until it got too hard. It's a simple story. But we too are faced with persecution because of our faith. And we are fortunate living in Australia, where we do not face life and death situations like our brothers and sisters of other persecuted countries. For them, they have to pay a heavy price to become a Christian. Family members will persecute them, cutting off ties, or even being chased out from homes, potentially losing their jobs and facing the dangers of their lives. Such is the cost of following Jesus. 
But at the same time, we do not go around praying for persecutions from God. We can grow through hardships, persecutions, trials, and temptations. God can use such situations to mold us and to strengthen our faith. And that is how we can mature our faith in God by learning to trust in Him. As opposed to the seeds that fall on thorny plants, it refers to the cares, worries of lives, and the deceitfulness of wealth that choke the Christian life, resulting in unfruitfulness. In Matthew chapter 6, it reminded us not to worry about life, what we eat, or what we will wear. We are called to set our priorities right, to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Do not let the cares and worries of these lives rob us of enjoying the abundant life that God has in store for us. Finally, we have the soil that falls on good, uh, we have the seed that falls on good soil. This refers to someone who hears the word, listen, and understand the word. Hunger for God's words and messages. This refers to believers who actively participate and engage in digesting the word and nurturing the growth. We want to be surrounded by a nurturing environment and not to be entangled with affairs of this world that chokes the growth or the fruitfulness. Let us build our confidence, faith, and trust in God for the harvest. Resting in God to do his work, we need to surrender to him. Our God is faithful and fruitful, and he is the Lord of the harvest. While the seeds are falling on good soil, growth takes time. It requires patience, and it does not happen overnight. Time and patience are the key ingredients to maturing the, uh, uh, the faith. How would you actively participate or engage in the kingdom of God? What is holding you back? Or are you entangled with affairs of this world? Responsiveness to his word encourages growth and fruitfulness, bearing fruits that will last. Our first key truth is, Jesus' true followers receive his truth, produce lasting fruit. Jesus' true followers receive his truth, produce lasting fruit. How is the condition of our hearts? Am I responding to listening and understanding God's word? Am I deeply rooted in God's word that produces good crops? How does my response to God impacting my fruitfulness? A passionate pursuit of God will touch every one of my relationships. And how is this evident in my family, in my church, and in my job? Are we experiencing rebuke or rejection because of our relationship with God? Is obedience and submission to God costly to you? Is the deceitfulness of wealth a pursuit of success choking your spiritual life? It's never too late to conduct a self-reflection and self-examination and then rededicate our lives to God. To offer our lives as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. Moving on to our second division, deceptions of the enemy. This parable of the weeds teaches those who seek to devour the truth by planting counterfeits. Now let us explore this parable and add the explanation at the same time. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. And the one who sowed good seeds is the son of man. And while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. Jesus wants us to know that there is more than one sower in the world. The enemy, the devil, is the one who sows weeds. Who are the people of the evil one? The enemy will come in the form 
of counterfeits. Satan plants his fix in the world right alongside God's children. As humans, we often cannot tell the difference. And the role of the enemy is to steal, kill, and to destroy. Therefore, while we coexist with the enemy, we need to be on the alert. God calls his children to be aware of the Satan's schemes so that we also trust in God's greater power. The servants ask him, do you want us to go and pull them out? Jesus answered that they should not pull out the weeds as the roots are intertwined and tangled with the wheat. As we pull the weeds out, you will also destroy the weeds. Therefore, let them grow together. In this parable, Jesus explained that the wheat and the wheat are to grow together. Likewise, in our world, believers are to live and to grow together with our enemies. And we can only do so by God's grace and relying on his strength and his power. While we live in this world, we are asked not to be of this world. We can be living together, and by God's grace and mercies, we can be making an impact and be a positive influence, a living testimony as children of God. These are divine opportunities for believers to minister and to testify God's unconditional love for all of his creation. We are all made in the image of God, and it is God's salvation plan to love the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but should have eternal life. John 3.16 God is patient, allowing them opportunities to repent of their sins. We can be tempted to pull out the weeds so that we can be living in a world of only believers. I can't stand him. Why is he still around, especially when all the wrong things and harms that he has caused to my family? I just wish that he is banished from the face of the earth. Now, has such scenario ever occurred to you before? Or similar thoughts cross your mind? Well, I must confess that it has certainly crossed mine, especially for someone who has caused us harm or stood in the way. But in this passage, I'm reminded that we are to live together. We are called to ex coexist with believers and pre-believers alike. We are to love our enemies, to bless those who curse you. While it can be hard to live among pre-believers and counterfeit Christians, God gives us opportunities to share his love with them. It is God's desire for them to repent of their sins. And the choices is theirs to make, not for you and for me to judge. As believers, we are to sow the seeds generously. We are to cast our sowing far and wide. The outcome is from God. We are not called to prejudge prematurely by pulling out the weeds. For judgment belongs to the Lord. God in his sovereign plan knows the right time when the judgment will take place. God's mercies allow time and opportunities for believers and pre-believers alike to repent of the sins. It is another opportunity for those who do not believe to truly turn to God in faith. In the end, God will separate real followers from those who are only pretending to be Christian and God judges perfectly. When I believe that God is a righteous judge, and I will perfectly evaluate every human, I understand the amazing gift of salvation in Christ. God did not only take the judgment I deserved, but he also opened a way for me to live the life that God intended for me to live. I learned to value what God values and seek eternal treasure. 
Therefore, we should not prejudge, for judgment belongs to God. During the judgment day, we will all be answerable to God. And that is when the wheat will be stored in the barn, while the weeds will be burned in the pit of fire. Likewise, when judgment day comes, the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of God. Our second principle is Jesus' true believers triumph despite enemies' deception. Jesus' true believers triumph despite enemies' deception. We need to know the truth by having a strong foundation of his word. Building upon the truth and establishing a strong foundation will help us to distinguish the cheap fakes, the counterfeits from the true stuff. How can how can you build upon the word of God, establishing a strong foundation, a foundation built on the rocks and not on the sands? Will you continue to sow generously, sowing far and wide the seed that God has given us? And how can we live harmoniously and peaceably in the world, but not of the world? By being a living testimony for God. To share the love of Christ, that by his grace, many will come and repent of their sins and join us in the kingdom of heaven. Will you ask God for greater measure of grace and love as, as we coexist with pre-believers in our communities that God has placed you? Not by your own power, but by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, going back to the Bonds movie. I'm hoping that at the end of the movie, the good will prevail. Just like the righteous will shine like the, like the sun in the kingdom of God. Thank you. Let's pray. Father, we just want to come before you this uh, afternoon to thank you, Father Lord, for your word. For your word that has spoken. Father, we ask that, Lord, you, you let us be deeply rooted in the word and the truth of your word. Father, we, we pray that, Lord, you will help us to, to grow deep and, and, and a strong foundation in the word of God, oh, Father, that will strengthen our faith and our walk with, with you. Let us not be choked by the deceitfulness and the wealth or the pursuit of success. Father, I pray that, Lord, you help us, oh, Father, Lord, to overcome, oh, Father, even with the temptations of this world. And Father, I pray that, Lord, you help us to bear fruits, fruits that will last, fruit that will, will, will have a lasting impact in our lives and making a positive influence of those to those who are around us. Help us, Lord, uh, to be a living testimony, O oh Father, even as we, we, we live among believers and pre-believers alike. I pray that, Lord, let us continue to be a testimony to you, O oh Father, to bear the, the name of the cross of Jesus Christ. Lord, uh, not by our own strength, by our own power, but by the power of the Holy Spirit. Father, I pray that, Lord, you will continue to, to lead us and guide us in, even in, as we live as Christians in the days to come. We pray all this and commit ourselves unto your hand. In Jesus' name, amen.